The Ipcris File. No, we're not talking today about the 1965 version with Michael Caine. We're talking about the ITV TV series, The Ipcris File, starring Joe Cole, coming in March. And on December 16th, 2021, Tom and I had the wonderful opportunity to attend via a Zoom meeting, a press briefing for the Ipcris File TV series through ITV. A bunch of the actors were there, the director and so on. So this was a thrill. There were 64 journalists from around the world that were invited and attended this meeting. So Tom and I were thrilled to be among them. Absolutely. Yeah, it will air in March 2022 on ITV and through the ITV Hub. Besides then, it's going to be in the U.S. on AMC Plus, and it'll debut on the Seven Network in Australia, Now TV in Hong Kong, Toho Kushincha in Japan, and Lionsgate Play in India, Indonesia, and Malaysia. So they're having a pretty wide distribution of this for something that's a streaming content. So let's go ahead and start off with a quick background on the podcast. Now, in August of 2020, Dan, you and I, we released our podcasts on the Harry Saltzman produced movie of the Len Dayton book, The Impress File. Yeah, yeah. These podcasts were very well received throughout the world. So thank you to our audience for that. Yeah, thanks. Now, later in the year, ITV announced that they obtained the rights to produce a TV series based on the book. This excited me greatly because as a six-part series, they're going to be able to have a lot more of the book get explored because they have more time to do it. Absolutely. Now, in our podcasts, we talked about what we liked and what we wished was different in the movie. Specifically, we called out the use of Harry's glasses that bring things in focus and fade out of focus. The fact that we like Jean's role, but we wish it was developed more. We Mm -hmm. want to see more of her story. We also talked about the trickery with the camera shots and how that bothered me. Yeah, And there's a part in the book about an atoll and this nuclear bomb stuff. It's not in the movie, so you wouldn't have missed it if you hadn't read the book. But after I saw the movie, I read the book, and I'm like, oh, Dayton wrote that so well. I could just picture it in my mind, and I want to see what they do with that. Yeah. So as we go through our experience here from the press conference, you're going to see why we're so excited about this series. Yeah. I think the series are going to give them a lot more flexibility in in terms of including a lot more character development, maybe some location stuff, and maybe some stuff in the book that was not in the movie. The movie, The Ipcris File, ran for one hour and 49 minutes, so they're going to have a lot more time here in a six-part series. This is an exciting series whose six episodes have been shot already in Liverpool, England, and Croatia. It promises to be an outstanding series starring Joe Cole, of Peaky Blinders fame, of course, as Harry Palmer, Tom Hollander as Major Dalby, Lucy Boynton as Jean Courtney, Paul Baisley as Morris, David Densick as Colonel Stock, <laughs> a great character, and Tamla Kari as Deborah. This is a tremendous cast, and in the press briefing, we were able to see some of the clips from the series, and wow yeah. is what we say. <laughs> Really, the acting is superb, but so is the cinematography, the sets, the ambiance of recreating a 1960s England and setting. Fantastic. I love this cast, Dan. Tom Hollander was just in The Kingsman, and yeah. he was really good in that. I mean, he's, he's good in everything. He's a phenomenal actor. He was also in Bohemian Rhapsody with Lucy Boynton. Yeah, there. Yeah. David Densick played my favorite character in No Time to Die, Valdo Obercheck. And he was also in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. And then Joe Cole coming off of Peaky Blinders and now is Sean Wallace in Gangs of London. Having him take on this role, I think he will be a really good fit for that. And don't forget that Ashley Thomas, who was on the press briefing, played Isaac Carter in the TV series 24 Legacy. So it'll be good to see him in this series in a slightly different type of a role. That cast is just amazing. It is. Of course, The Ipocrist File is based on the works of Len Dayton, and we've remembered the 1960s movie trilogy starring Michael Caine as Harry Palmer, of course, in The Ipocrist File, Funeral in Berlin, and Billion Dollar Brain. We have podcasts out on all three of those movies, and actually we got some nice comments from someone very connected to The Ipocrist File, original series with Michael Caine, and the ITV series as well. (laughs) So check them out. The character Harry Palmer is offered an opportunity to be a spy versus serving prison time. And that is the basis of his personality and interactions with his boss, Major Dalby. 
Kane was superb, of course, but the 1960s was a long time ago, and not much has been done with Harry Palmer since, other than maybe a couple of made-for-TV movies that weren't really that well-received. So, now we move to the present. The briefing was expertly hosted by Boyd Hilton, and in attendance were Joe Cole, Lucy Boynton, Tom Hollander, John Hodge, the writer, James Watkins, the series director, and Ashley Thomas. Wow, this was fantastic. John Hodge, the writer, suggested that this is a great spy story, embracing social mobility and class, glass ceilings, and more. He's a fan of the books and said that it was appealing to turn this into a six-part TV series. He also suggests that the tone will be humor, the warmth of human interaction, the feeling of humanity, and highlighting small moments, human weaknesses and strengths. So, yeah, he, he came back to that humanity word a few times during this yeah. briefing. So this is something to definitely be looking for when you're yeah. watching this, that this theme of humanity coming out. I think that's going to be a fun element of all of this. So this briefing was terrific because we're learning all of these kinds of things in the background of what they intend to do and what they're, what they're how they've reacted to the entire filming of this series. So this is going to be fun. Now, for me, another thing to watch out is I'm looking for the atoll and that the whole part of the story that happens on there that wasn't in the movie. So going into this briefing, I'm sitting there saying, please, please, please tell me you've got this. Tell me you've got this. It was my favorite part of the book. I've got to see this in this series. Yeah, well, we'll see. That's a little later in the book, isn't it? We'll see. It's later in the book and we'll see yeah, we, when we talk about locations, what's up. All right, Lucy Boynton gave us her insights next and said that her character, Jean Courtney, is an interesting woman in the 1960s liberation environment. A very interesting era. Here, we may find out more of Jean's personal life. She was an intriguing character in the book, but limited. In this series, we will see more of her personality and her in an expanded professional role. That's cool. Well, that is. And in the briefing, they reminded us the book is written in first person. Remember, Harry doesn't have a name in the novel. And so since it was done first person, some of the other characters weren't super well developed. So they're able to do that here. And if we remember at the beginning of this podcast, we mentioned we'd like to see more of Jean's character developed. Yeah. And we're going to get that here, which is very, very cool. I, I really, really like that, that they're that they're doing this. I also like the fact that they kept this set in the 1960s. Yeah, so they yeah. didn't redo it and make it, oh, here it is, modernized. It's yeah. We're flushing out the story more by going with a six-part series, but we're keeping it back with the 60s feel. Yeah. Now, two things that Lucy Boynton said about Jean that grabbed my attention during the briefing was she said, quote, she uses that societal underestimation of young woman to her advantage. Yeah. So I want to see how they play that out. And then she said, and she's such a commentary on what it's like to be a woman in a male-dominated industry. Yeah. And going back into the 60s, I mean, even today, we still have glass ceilings and all of that, which shouldn't be there. But in the 60s, it was a lot more prevalent, I think. As for the first quote, Lucy Boynton also said that Jean can hide in plain sight. And yeah. in the book, Jean is Harry's assistant. However, in the series, Jean is an agent in her own right. And, quoting Lucy, is bloody good at what she does. So... I'm really looking to see how they've expanded that character. Yeah, I, I'm I'm looking forward to that too, because in the movie, you wanted her to do more. And so this is going to be cool to see how it expands. Ashley Thomas, who plays Maddox, he fleshes out the character of an African-American in the 1960s, a very capable man with twists and turns who is in a position of power. So it's interesting to explore this dynamic as an African-American in that time period. In the series, he has a sense of humor, smiles during some tense moments, he said, which relieves some of the tension and seriousness of some of the scenes. Ashley said that he approaches each character with respect in terms of accents, backstory, and so on. And he wanted to get that unique perspective on 1960s African-Americans. Ashley also liked the fish and chips, he said, <laughs> in Liverpool, where they... They filmed a lot of the series. So. And I, I love that he said that because when you've got these briefings, they're talking about the shoot and everything. And here he's giving you a little bit of background and a little bit of flavor on him. So I, I like the way that he included that. I thought that was good. Yeah, that was fun. Now, he also talked about how his character has expanded, especially for an African-American in the time of racial oppression. 
Yeah. He said they made, and I'm going to put quotes here, sure these things were addressed. And I wasn't just shoehorned into the series. So I was really excited that with what John and James had come up with for the character. He's a very capable man, and many people who are African-American or just black, whether in the UK or the US, are very capable. Given the state of society at that time, they weren't given those opportunities. He then says he's in a position of power. He's going to have to be very good, if not better than some of his counterparts, to be in those positions. And he mentioned then that black people were often not shown in positions of power during that time period. And even his first line on screen is, yes, that's right, I'm black. Yeah. So both with Gene and with Maddox here, we get that humanity that John Hodge was talking about and how that's going to come through through the series. Yeah, yeah, he's going to be good in that role. Tom Hollander, playing Major Dalby, said it was a strong script by John Hodge, witty, economical, authentic to the period, and while still making things fresh. So Dalby, he thinks, is a headmaster type, complicated and slightly jaded. And he looked at the script, looked at the original film, but he said he did not finish the book. (laughs) There you go. I like that Hollander says that Dalby was fun to play. And Joe Cole's going to actually talk about the fact that he didn't watch the whole movie either because they want to be able to make these parts their own. Mm -hmm. But But I think that Hollander said that Dalby was going to be a fun part for him to play. And that as the headmaster, there were some slightly jaded points that probably added to the fun of this thing. And Mm -hmm. he is such a good actor that it was good to hear his excitement for this role because Dalby's a pretty huge part to the story in the book and in the movie. We'll see how big a role, and I assume it's a big part here in the series as well. And he also commented, again, giving us a little background on how the writers, John and James, were quite receptive to character development ideas from the actors. Yeah, that was Yeah, so they were able to give the writers and directors some input, and he says that's not always received well. So it's good to see that because it's nice when the person who's being filmed can say, wait a minute, I think I would do better with it this way, and they then taking that. So it's nice to see that that input gets taken, and we see better performance because of it. Yeah, I I think overall all of the people that were in this briefing – we're saying the same thing, that the group of people work so well together, including interaction with the director and so on and, and the writer. Great stuff. So Joe Cole, of course, he's Harry Palmer. Joe said that he was not really familiar with Harry Palmer, but after speaking with people, he realized what an important character he is. He saw the Michael Caine stuff, he said, but still wanted to do his own thing. He looked at the book, watched the movie, but did not want to do a Michael Caine impersonation, he said. He wanted to do his own thing with it. I thought that was great insight. Yeah. I mean, it, it would be so easy. And Joe Cole's not, a, you know, I mean, he's, he's in his 30s, right? So he, he's not. I agree, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So he's in his 30s. So for him to be able to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to take on this iconic role. And it'd be really easy to just say, I'm just going to duplicate what the first guy did. Yeah. And with Michael Caine, it'd be very easy to fall into an impersonation there. So it's yeah. good to see that Cole acknowledges and recognize that point and points yeah. out he didn't want to just do an impersonation. So we aren't going to just get a Michael Caine impersonation yeah, in right. the character of Harry Palmer here, which is great. Yeah, we always saw that struggle with the Bond movies as well. I'm not going to do the, the Bond the way the other guy did the Bond. I want to take my own spin on it, make my own spin on it and so on. But you had a bunch of them. You had six different actors playing Bond. Here, you only had Michael Caine to look at. So it could have been, it would have been easy to just in, try to impersonate him. And, and that's exactly what they were. he was trying to avoid, Joe. So that, that was terrific. He also talked about the point of a working class versus his superiors. And when Joe was asked how it felt to put on those glasses for the <laughs> first time, that was a great question. I love that. Joe said it was important to get them right. And he he said he tried on a bunch of different kinds of glasses and the haircut, the glasses, the clothes, all very important. And he joked that the glasses were a great thing to hide behind. (laughs) And he admitted (laughs) they they were (laughs) non-prescription. He had laser surgery, he said, but yeah, so, but he does have them on here. Yeah. So from the clips we have seen, and we saw some during the briefing, and of course they have a trailer out from January, Joe does a bang up brilliant job as Harry Palmer. They did keep the glasses thing as part of the Harry Palmer image, which we love. That's terrific. That's great stuff. 
let's move on to James Watkins. James Watkins is the series director. And he said they started with Joe Cole as Harry Palmer, and they built around that. He suggested that Joe has the intersection of gentleness and knowing the world is against him. He said that Joe as Harry uses humor well and is the kind of guy you want to hang out with. Kind of like Han Solo, he said. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Now, another thing that he mentioned that, that kind of hit me was that Len Dayton describes Harry Palmer as a winner who puts himself across as a loser. Mm, yeah. He's angry and he's got insolence. And, and he said, Joe and I spent a lot of time trying to capture that tone. Yeah. So again, pulling the character, trying to keep it true to the book. I, I just, I think that's great. Yeah, yeah, it is. The opening shot is of the glasses. First, the scene is out of focus and then in focus when the glasses are on. Just like the movie. That was neat. I liked that. That's another thing we mentioned in our podcast that we liked about the movie is how they yeah. used the glasses to provide focus. And it's great. And they said here they want they wanted to give a little wink to the movie with the way they did that. Yeah. Now, Hodge had added that the series comments on social attitudes, social issues, mobility. That era in the 1960s had freedom promised, but not always delivered. That was an interesting line. Yeah, it was. And again, it's why I think they set this in the 60s and didn't try to modernize it. Because yeah. we saw it in the movie, and it's good to see they wanted to keep that feel here. Yes. Because that's kind of fitting to what you think of with Harry Palmer. Yeah. And you really do get a great feel for the period, the era, 1960s. It's done so well. All right. Lucy Boynton, playing Jean Courtney, said that Joe Cole brought a sense of humor and a freedom to have fun with it. And she said her character, Jean, was a person who was impenetrable and that Harry was the first to penetrate that. Joe was asked if Harry was an anti-James Bond. And Joe said that he read that somewhere. He's very different, he said, and sees Harry as a working class guy who doesn't have a lot of money and who is hyper intelligent and he's fun. Yeah, Cole says the most important thing for me was to try to capture that. Yeah. So cool. they point it out and they're letting us know, hey, right, this is what we're going for here. Yeah, the trick was making Harry likable too. Likable, but facetious and try to strike this balance. And he wanted to push a few buttons that make Harry tough and critical, but also likable. <laughs> and he gave this example where he described a scene at the beginning of the first episode when Harry's with Gene. He talked about the writing and Lucy's powerful performance as Jean in this scene and how it could really make Harry look um, bad. I mean, and how he, oh. how Joe had to make Harry likable. Well, he, he really said he looked like a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> it, it was That's why I just said bad. I was trying to keep a U.S. polite. Sorry. <laughs> the repartee between Joe as Harry and Tom as Dalby is great. Just terrific. Tom said it was in the taut, witty script. And, he, and this is a quote, dynamic class stuff in it, unquote. They talked about how Harry knows that he's trapped, forced to be a spy, but that Dolby is kind of also trapped in a way, both dancing on their own pinheads, restricted by the world that is theirs, they said. That's kind of cool. That is, that is. And then Joe gave us some insight into acting with an accomplished actor like Tom Hollander. Joe initially thought in his first scenes with Dolby, Harry was going to have a swagger about him, but then he thought, no, Tom will see right through that. So yeah. he squashed those ideas and went with what John had written. And you don't hear actors talk too much about that. So again, I love some of the background they gave us in, in this press briefing. And that was a great insight. And you could see that in the characters themselves. I mean, this is just brilliant stuff. This is so well done. Everybody who likes spy stuff is going to enjoy this series. All right, let's talk a little bit about the locations that they filmed this series in. And that's going to be really important to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're wishing for the atoll. <laughs> in general, they commented that locations were important for the character's journey. James Watkins, the director, says they're going to some of the places that were in the book that they didn't have in the movie due to budgetary constraints. So this is going to be kind of neat. Yes, they said they're going to the atoll, they're going to Beirut, they're going to Finland, and I believe they're going to the Berlin Wall, he said as well. 
So yeah. this makes me really happy because, again, as I said, I saw, I saw the movie first and then read the book and realized what wasn't in the movie when I read the book. And with the way Len Dayton wrote these locations and wrote the parts of the story at these locations, I really want to see them. So, yes, thank you. James also said, quote, James Bond is a superhero movie, whereas Harry Palmer is a real person. He wants to not work on his weekends and he wants to reclaim his expenses is interested in what, about what he's cooking. It's real life. I, I like that line. That, I think that's a great way to describe the difference yeah. between Harry and James. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So he's a real guy, and the plot in the series is to get to know the characters, and he says, hang out with them. So kind of cool. Neat. The cast was asked what they thought of the filming in Liverpool, and Tom Hollander said that he liked Liverpool because it was full of amazing buildings, and history, and bits of Britain from the 1960s, he said, are still there. He actually said it was the first production in the UK during COVID, so there were adjustments with masks and stuff, and Joe said that he liked Liverpool, while Lucy said she had never been to Liverpool before, so they all kind of liked it. Yeah, so they, they all liked Liverpool. It was interesting to hear how the pandemic lockdowns affected their experience, but yeah. actually got his fish and chips. <laughs> yeah, which he loves. All right, so as for costumes, let's talk about that for, for a second, because they did. James Watkins said that they looked at stuff from the 1960s so that they could, quote, incorporate elements of the character information, unquote, through the costumes. That's kind of a brilliant little line. Incorporate elements of the character information through the costumes. That's great. Like he said, there's a collision between the way Dalby and Palmer dress, the class thing again. Yeah, class is really important in this story, really in all three stages, the, the series, the book, and the movie. Yeah. The color palette, in general, they talked about, too. They wanted to show a kind of a bleached color palette to kind of look like the 1960s. Dirty whites, grit, more life textures in terms of costumes and design. Kind of a pattern of dirtiness, really. Okay, okay. So the, the geek in me is going to come out here, right? Because <laughs> okay, I right. loved this part of the discussion. And uh, you know, sorry if you don't really care about the technical details here. I'm going to go into this a little bit. Because very few people talk about this. They filmed this. They wanted to get the 1960s feel of filming on film, not digital. Yeah. And, you know, we often will hear people will talk either saying, oh, you've got to listen to a record on vinyl versus on DVD or, or digital, or you've got to shoot on film or you've got to film on digital, but they don't say why one or the other. Yeah. But here James Watkins talked about the differences. That was and neat. He, and he said that the cinematographer, Tim Morris Jones, spent a lot of time talking with him about that. They talked about how to make a chemical film approach to a digital film. How do they get the reds right? Well, they yeah. use the plum red. Whites are dirty ivory whites. If you film a white wall in digitally, he said, it's all ones and zeros, and it looks the same from frame to frame. Yeah. But on film, each frame is a different photochemical composition, so there's a grain structure to it. Yes, again, this is geeky, but it <laughs> helped me understand the differences in some of the choices they made and some of the things they had to do with their technology to try to get this to look right and make it look like it was, it was something great, shot on film in the 60s i agree it was a great discussion that was a great i mean most people aren't thinking like this right yeah. you're just watching the thing and you're not thinking about the color palettes or anything else especially not thinking digital versus film and the graininess and the texture and so on this was great stuff i thought when we talked to roberto schaefer the director of photography for quantum of solace we were talking about the color palette of the yellows and stuff that were used in that Gold and here and here, that was for the movie. Here, they're talking about the challenges of trying to shoot on digital, but make it look like it's film. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought that was really, really good. Now, I, I do have to say, one part of this discussion does scare me a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Remember at the beginning of this podcast, I mentioned that the tricky camera angles in the movie bothered me. Uh -huh. Now, Harry Saltzman, who produced the movie, got into disagreements with the director of the movie about these tricky angle shots that they had in the movie. Uh -huh. And I mean, it got pretty nasty from what they say on the commentary about the movie. Well, Watkins mentions there are off kilter camera angles in the series. Yeah. He says they tried to look at the third man for inspiration. Yeah. Well, to I to love, me, that's an uh oh. I, know. I, I love the variety and unique camera angles in the original movie. So I'm hoping that they continue that here. And it sounds like they did 
at least to some degree, which yeah, is, but, I think is terrific. And I think Harry Salzman finally came around and said, yeah, well, that, Peter I, Hunt told him, yeah. I like it, keep it. Yeah. <laughs> and that pretty much <laughs> shut it down. Now, one of the things that has me a little frightened here is Tim Maurice Jones was the director of photography for the just released movie, The 355. Yeah. Now, on a review of that, we commented on the shakiness and the off-playing camera shots, especially yes. for the close-in fight scenes and how we didn't like those. So we'll have to see what Watkin means by off-kilter camera angles in this series. However, this is a bit of concern for me. Yeah, it was great. And I hope they do the kind of thing they did in the original movie where it was like the one scene where it was shooting through the, from the inside of a phone booth to the steps where there was a fight going on. That, that through was the a keyhole. Cool. Yeah. It's a cool scene. So I hope they do more stuff like that, which would be terrific. I liked it a lot. All right. So now we're, we're kind of coming to the end of the briefing here. And they introduced Kevin Ligo, and he's the ITV's director of television. And he said that this is a great production and called it movie quality. And really, from the clips we saw during the briefing, it looked like movie quality. And, and the trailer. And the trailer, right. You'll see in the trailer, and you can find on YouTube, it was January 24th, 2022. The photography, the cinematography, the production is high value, high value. They seem to joke around a bit that this was a higher level production than what ITV normally produces. <laughs> he was joking about that. They compared it to big budget Netflix series stuff. Man, from what we saw, he's absolutely right. It looks fabulous. And it, it really does. And if you look at the list we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, they kept the stuff that we like. And with the exception of the off-kilter camera stuff that Dan and I are a little disagreement on here, they addressed the stuff we didn't like. In his case, them keeping that off-kilter stuff in is a positive for Dan. So personally for me, I can't wait for this thing to come out. And I've said it a bunch of times, that Ethel scene, I just got to see this. <laughs> and this press conference just has me waiting on the edge of my seat for March when this thing comes out. Yeah. I mean, it was great to be invited to the press conference. Again, we were two, Tom and I, of 64 journalists around the world on the call. So this was pretty special. A lot of fun. All right. So that's a wrap. We want to thank ITV for inviting us to this press conference for the upcoming ITV series, The Ipcris File. It is going to be terrific. Coming out March 2022. Put it on your calendars. You're going to love it. I can't wait. This has been Dan Silvestri. And Tom Pizzotto. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Remember, please subscribe to our show right now. Hit that subscribe button. Check out our videos on our Cracking the Code of Spy Movies YouTube channel. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. And we welcome you to join our Facebook group, the Worldwide Community of Spy Movie Fans. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it.